Oh, yeah. That's Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our uh, talk today with uh, Dr. Nolene Smith in the Botanic Gardens on Plants and Pandemic. Um, hopefully, everybody can hear me. Uh, my name is Glenn Anderson. I'm the head guide here in um, the National Botanic Gardens. And I'm just going to talk to you about a couple of things before I invite Nolene on to talk. Um, this is the first of our um, scheduled spring um, online talks. Uh, we're trying to have one now every Wednesday at three o'clock, a couple of little exceptions. So if you're interested, have a look later at our, our website or our social media, um, the next ones that are coming up. Next week, uh, we have a digital cafe run by Concern and ourselves at 11.30 about the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So I think that'll be interesting. Um, if you're new to Crowdcast, and I say a lot of people are, um, you'll see there's a little um, chat box on the right-hand side. You're very welcome to um, put your comments in there. Uh, my colleague Charlotte is on board as well, and she'll be monitoring those comments. And uh, down the bottom, you'll see ask a question, and you can put a question in there if you have a particular question, and we'll get to them at the end. We're going to talk, uh, well, nobody's going to talk for 40, 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll take some questions. Um, just, I, I noticed that a few people from outside Ireland already, if I was going to say, if you're from outside Ireland, we'd love to just put a little uh, note in, in the chat box because uh, we'd like to we'd like to have a look at that and make, make us feel a bit more cosmopolitan. Um, final comment is uh, just that you should know we are recording this and the, the, the text, the chat will be recorded as well. Uh, so just want to make you aware of that. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to Nolene. Um, I'm doing that. Uh, Nolene is on screen. As I'm doing that, I'm just going to tell you about Nolene. Nolene is, is our conservation botanist in the herbarium at the National Botanic Gardens. And she's worked on lots of different projects um, related to plant conservation. And she acts as the Scientific Authority for Ireland, advising on sustainability, so, excuse me, sustainable trade in rare species. So I'm going to hand over to Nolene. Um, so Nolene, welcome. Um, oh, thanks, Glenn. Yeah. This is, can uh, everybody see Nolene? If anybody can see Nolene, just say say so. But uh, I think we should be up and running. Great stuff. Thanks, Glenn. I'm going to uh, attempt. This is our first online talk, and uh, I'm feeling a little bit like Beaker here. Uh, it's all experimental, but I'm going to attempt to share my uh, screen now. And uh, oops, I don't just see my talk yet. Um, mm -mm. Sorry about this. Uh, Sorry guys, we're off to a bit of a slow start here. Uh, oh, why is that not? It all worked perfectly well earlier, I promise. Oh, yeah. uh, share screen and sharing the, the application window. Okay, application window. Oh dear. Sorry, Glenn, I am letting you down now. Oh. No, it's all right. We have just a few uh, feeding problems. So, uh, so, so share my screen. So if I have it open on my screen, that should work. And there we go. Oh, yes, there we go. Application window. Share and slideshow. Oh, that looks That's good. Are we here? We are there, yeah. Okay. And uh, okay, are we... I think we're ready to go then. Brilliant. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, hooray. Okay. Whew. <laughs> That's a big relief. Um, yeah. So it's lovely to be online with you all today. And uh, how bizarre for us all to be in such strange situations, all, to, all uh, sitting, sitting at home or sitting in our offices or today. So today I'm going to talk to you about plants and the pandemic. And I suppose it's just some of the interactions and links I've thought about um, about plants and the pandemic just during the last year and some of the things that have crossed my desk in the last year in relation to plants and, and, the, and the pandemic. So it's rather a beautiful looking thing. You can see all its little receptors there. So the first thing I'm going to do is, is bombard you with a pile of numbers. And my, my daughter's favorite thing to do every day is ask me how much is 100 billion billion multiplied by two and things like this. And most times I can't even answer. So these, I'm going to put up lots of numbers here. This is some of our favorite games, 7 billion, 843 million, 104 million, 2 million, 
3,752, 4,171. So I'm just going to say to you, this is our life in numbers today. So the top number is the population of the world today, 7.8, over 7.8 billion of us. 104 million of us have contracted uh, COVID-19 and 2 million sadly have passed away. And in Ireland today, this number stands at 3,752, very sadly. The number at the bottom there is 4,171. And this is the number of weeks we have in our lives between zero and 80. And many of you online are like me, and uh, I definitely have less than 2,000 weeks left in my life, which is pretty shocking, even if I don't contract COVID. So a week can be a very long time, it can be a very short time, but just to show to you that all life is quite precious. So this is our life, and this is COVID-19 in numbers today. So it's hard to believe that we're actually standing on the, we're actually at the anniversary. It's, it's the first, um, nearly tomorrow, uh, that this virus got named as uh, the disease got called COVID-19. So this happened on the 11th of February, 2020, which is quite somber. So a year later, um, it's hard to believe how all our lives and all our worlds have changed. So the first case was recorded in uh, Wuhan on the 8th of December in 2019. And uh, I know there's a World Health Organization team there at the moment trying to discover, um, you know, where the whole thing has originated from. And there's some very good papers. So you can kind of see how quickly uh, this thing has taken hold of our lives. And a year later, we're, we're still pretty much in the, in the thick of it and we're still dealing with this disease. So today, uh, I'm going to maybe take you on a journey to where it all started, uh, where we're at today and uh, maybe travel a little bit back in time to that to that region in China with an Irishman called Augustine Henry. And I'm going to tell you about some local news that totally cheered me up and maybe some talk about a little about some of the latest COVID-19 trends. And um, and finally, maybe three things that each, each one of us could do today that maybe could, could make a difference. So where did it all come from? Well, this is the market. This is the, the Wuhan, Wuhan market in uh, in Wuhan and uh, basically this is where all the first cases came out of um, so there's a lot it's a it's a wet market or a wild animal market and there's many uh, animals in here that can be illegally captured they're slaughtered in front of the customer it's it's quite a, a, a thing in China and this is not like uh, maybe like Ebola in Africa where it's like subsistence living uh, wild animal meat is not cheap it's it's actually uh, it's a it's a luxury item in China and uh, it's, it's very much sought after and a lot of wild animals are resold into this uh, multi-million pound industry and, uh, and a lot of legal trade surrounding it and it's right up there with drugs. So this market, and uh, this is one of the conservation um, uh, biologists, Diane Bell, who's worked a lot on maybe uh, discussing SARS and stuff. So some of her papers are very interesting around, um, you know, what we've learned from SARS and really, you know, telling us that we really haven't learned a lot. So COVID-19, this disease links to one of the world's most illegally trafficked mammals. And this is a very strange thing. And I was very lucky as part of my role in the National Botanic Gardens to be uh, to advise on trade in endangered species. And here I am with some colleagues, Rosanna Currens and Orlando Varaccia from National Parks and Wildlife Service. And we're on the, the Irish desk at this conference here. Uh, this is the World Wildlife Conference and it's held every three years. And that one was held in South Africa in uh, 2016. And the chair is the lady in white there, Dr. Karen Gaynor. And somebody might know, some of you might, online might definitely know Karen Gaynor as uh, one of Ireland's former coastal ecologists. So Karen was chair at this particular meeting in South Africa. And one of the big um, uh, kind of uh, animals and one of the big species up for discussion were pangolins. And pangolins, uh, along with bats, carry the first strain which affected people. So uh, bats are known to be the, the kind of source, but that the, the next link, so the, the, the one that's in bath, it needs receptors for to get to people. So pangolins, uh, while not the only maybe intermediate link, they definitely carry the strain that have affected people. And these are very bizarre looking things, like you wouldn't really come across them in your everyday life. There's only about eight species. Uh, for them in Africa, for them in Asia, and they're really shy ant-eating mammals. Like they have, their tongues are longer than their bodies, which I think is quite fascinating. So they they really they root about with their tongues and uh, um, and eat up animals. So very little is actually known about their ecology. They're very cryptic things, and bizarrely, they're related to cats and wolves. 
So they become really popular for meat and medicine uh, in Asia and especially in China. And this guy here, Dan Challender, and Dan has been, uh, uh, you know, promoting conservation of pangolins for many years now. So it was a great, uh, it was great that um, in 2016 that 19 countries got together and proposed the uplisting. So they proposed them to be listed on CITES Appendix 1. And that means you're not allowed to trade in them at all. The only trade is meant to be for conservation. So, yeah, and Ireland was there voting alongside Uplist and Pangolin, just made sense, they're very rare. Um, but really, sometimes people say when you list something as an endangered species, it suddenly sends the price to the roof. Um, and, and that's what happened with pangolins. Um, so in one uh, illegal trade seizure, 25 tonnes of pangolin scales, so uh, 50,000 dead pangolins, the market value of $7 million. So you can imagine, um, so really sometimes by uplisting what we think we might uh, be conserving a species, we're maybe actually highlighting their, their rarity and also maybe their value on the market. And this is what happened with pangolins. So we know horseshoe bats in China definitely carry coronavirus and maybe pangolins were rooting around in dirt below them we don't really know but we know definitely there's been a big trade and been a big trade in asia and china in these things uh, they just produce one or two offspring a year so illegal trade is pretty catastrophic to the pangolins but now as we're discovering it's also pretty ca catastrophic to us too so they don't immediately pose any threat to us but the problem arises is when they're they're taken from the natural environment and they're sold uh, basically illegally for meat and medicine. So any pangolin in trade at the moment is, is there illegally. And it just brings this virus threat closer to home. And that's the United Nations Drugs and Organized Crime uh, report from 2020. So you and me, well, we're nothing but mammals and uh, this, this virus uh, loves mammals. So just before Christmas, uh, we had mink linked to 214 um, coronavirus cases or COVID cases in Denmark. And there was a big uh, loaded to do in the newspapers about uh, calling mink in Denmark. Um, in the Middle East, the Middle East respiratory syndrome was linked to camels. Uh, SARS was linked to these uh, civet cats. And some people think maybe uh, coronavirus, COVID is also linked with these civet cats because they're actually farmed in China. So there's known links to civet cats from SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome, another coronavirus. And I suppose, yes, we're all susceptible. Even our little tabbies are susceptible. So among domestic animals, cats are the most susceptible. Like there's no evidence that cats are, are, are spreading COVID-19, but they're definitely as susceptible as we are. And you can kind of see this, there's a huge range of species there. Um, so, and we're all mammals. And uh, basically the World Health Organization is saying that it's going from humans to animals and back to humans. And every time it happens, the virus changes even more slightly. And I, I think, um, and, and it, it can change even more. So while we're waiting for the vaccine, we don't want it swapping back and forth to different species. Uh, we really want to get a handle on it now. So it, it is a worry that, um, yeah, we're all mammals and we're all connected here. So I've titled this one, Nowhere to Run and Nowhere to Hide. So one of the shops inside the market had wolf pups, bamboo rats, squirrels, foxes, civets, hedgehogs, and all sorts of animal parts. So basically it was all in this market. and. Bushmeat hunting is, is really driving a lot of mammals and animals to extinction in this paper, in the Royal Society. So in this graph they produce, the top graph, you can see the red bits are where all the animals, uh, where the hotspots for mammal density or diversity is. And in the bottom graph you can see is the hotspots for hunting them. So you can kind of see that part of Southeast Asia and the bottom part of China is where um, there's a lot of hunting of mammals going on. So they're all threatened by hunting down there. So if we overlay that and think about where's the world's uh, most plant plant rich areas and the most biodiverse, uh, the ones that have the most plants and animals. If we look at this map here, uh, these are all the mega biodiverse countries. So there's about 5,000 endemic uh, species of plants. And surprisingly, yeah, we don't often think of it, but animals really like to live in places with plants. And, um, and so you can kind of see the map previous where the hotspots for mammals are also the hotspots for plants. And uh, so this was one of the graphs. This is one of paper that came across my desk about two years ago. And I keep showing this graph because when I seen it, it actually, it really shocked me um, because you can see the hotspots from the previous graph, graphs for the animals and for the plants. And here is actually putting dates on when they will all disappear. 
So you can kind of see there the west coast of Africa, some, I think that's Cote d'Ivoire there. And uh, so basically they're predicting a disturbance and degradation is the same rate as we're happening now, uh, that all the forest there is going to be gone in three years. If you look at that, um, uh, yeah, the Democratic Republic Congo, everything gone in 80 years. Uh, Brazil lasts a bit longer, but most everything has a two zero on the right hand side, which is which is really shocking. And uh, most of them on the left hand side of a two zero. So that's all of our basically moist primary forests gone in the next hundred years. So where are the animals going to live? And uh, really, it's 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 pretty much uh, people talk about a biodiversity and climate emergency and this to me is this the graph the the map that shows how much of an emergency situation we're in uh, and this is today and uh, we really are if we don't do something like pretty radical this is this is where we're at but anyway let's take a journey back in time uh, with augustine henry to 1881 so augustine henry was an irishman from the north of ireland from jerry and uh, he um trained as a medical doctor so here's some Good, embarrassing, uh, nice shots of uh, a few of us when we were younger here, and I'm going to tell you the story. And this is Seamus O'Brien. So Seamus here is top right. So Seamus led these expeditions in the footsteps of this uh, great Augustine Henry. So Glass 7 went out as a, an organized expedition in, in uh, 2002, and I think Seamus traced every footstep. I went along for one of the trips in, in 2002, and it was absolutely fascinating. So you can kind of see our director here, Matthew. You can see uh, the lovely Grace, who's no longer with us. And you can see some Paul Moore, our, our curator, and Jimmy and Helen Dillon and something. So it was a great trip. It was really a fascinating trip. And we followed the footsteps of this great man through central China. So he stayed for 20, around 20, 19 years in China. He had graduated from Galway uh, in natural sciences uh, when he was just 20. And uh, he went off then to train in Queens and Edinburgh and he became a medical doctor. So he's just 24 years old when he set off to work with the Chinese Customs Service. So what a big adventure. So at the start, he was based at this place called Yichang and uh, his first lengthy posting was here on the on the Yangtze River and it's about 1500 kilometers inland from Shanghai. And the big excitement in Henry's life at the start was really the six boats that went to Wuhan every day. And uh, he was watching what was going down in those boats. So it was medicinal plants and timbers moving from east to west. So firewood was the big um, kind of trade along the river and they were all carried down on these steamer boats down to the big cities. So this is the, the Yangtze here, this is China, you can kind of see Shanghai there, Nanjing, Wuhan, this, the, the center of our corona, and you can see where Henry was based here at Jichang and Chongqing. So the, the Yangtze, this total, uh, this big artery in China for moving goods from east to west. So that was Wuhan uh, when Henry was there around the start of the century, and this is Wuhan today. So there's 11.8 million people living in Wuhan today. So the whole thing has uh, exploded exponentially in, in the last hundred years. So Henry is most famous uh, for revealing this whole beautiful flora of China to the West. And a lot of our garden plants have the name Henry stuck to them. So there's there's maples with Henry eye, there's limes with Henry eye, there's lilies with Henry eye. So a lot of our garden plants actually come from China and uh, we would be very, our gardens would be uh, very poor in species if we didn't have all these wonderful Chinese plants to select from. So Henry, Henry every time he came across the plant, he was sending it back to the to Q and saying, what is it? Or, you know, trying to get a, a name on it. And, and during his time from all this, he discovered 25 new genera and about 500 new species, which is absolutely astounding. So one of Henry's favorite plants and definitely one of my favorite plants is this one here, Davidia involucrata. So when Henry see this first, he thought it was a strange sight and uh, he's seen it in full blow, waving its innumerable ghost handkerchiefs. And he just said, Davidia is wonderful. And I would urge you all online today to take a trip to put it in your diaries today for the first week in May. And that's when you will actually see this wonderful tree and flower. And it's 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 so amazing. Do some forest bathing, stand in and eat it. Uh, and it flowers, as I say, in the first week in May. And it's absolutely, it's absolutely stunning. Um, so this was Henry's great gift to us, was revealing this huge flora to us. But his, his interest really, he was a doctor. So medicinal plants really were his first interest. And he uh, wrote this book here, Notes on the Economic Botany of China. 
And uh, really, he was looking at the Chinese names for for things and trying to translate them into kind of understandable Latin for us into the the Latin names that we might kind of figure out which plant belonged to which root. So this was his great um, gift really to us all was uh, notes on the economic botany of China. And this is one plant we've seen in our trip, Codenopsis tanshen. And it was an important drug um, among poor people because it was a substitute for costly ginseng. And in Henry's day, there was over 500 to uh, tons of this plant exported from Hankou, which is one of the, the three uh, cities that joined up to form Wuhan now. So even then, there was a huge trade in uh, medicinal plants. And here, medicinal plant stalls were very common in China in 2002. And I'm, I'm sure lots of countries still have um, uh, traditional medicine and um, plant stalls like this are very common uh, throughout, the, throughout a lot of the world. So traditional, if we look at traditional herbal medicines today, well, it's, it's, it's a good becoming a big trend. So there's 26,000 medicinal plant species sourced from the wild today, and over 3,000 of them are traded internationally. About a thousand of these are considered rare enough that they warrant some measure of protection under CITES, which is the Convention on Trade and Endangered Species. So you have to get a permit to export it and a permit to import it if it's coming into Europe. Um, so there's about 15,000 of these, it's reckoned, that uh, they're threatened in some form or other through over-harvesting, habitat loss, climate change or illegal international trade. So even traditional medicine um, is, is falling into this illegal trade category and habitat loss, so that it's all changing. So Henry's work, as I said, was really useful from translating um, you know, the Chinese names for, uh, for things, so making it understandable Latin, so we actually know which plants are kind of in a lot of these bowls. So one of the reports that crossed my desk last year was this one here from Traffic and Anastasia, and they're based in Cambridge, and they kind of look at, um, you know, trade uh, around the world and maybe highlight places where there's uh, unsustainable trade. And they call this report the invisible trade, and it's called Wild Plants and You in the Time of COVID-19 and Our Essential Journey Towards Sustainable sustainability. And they pointed out some of the numbers that I showed you there. But I suppose if we think of the world as uh, going forward to being sustainable, they said 60 to 90 percent of the plants that are wild collected are collected by rural and marginalized communities. And many of these people rely on their plants for their income and well-being. So like that little stall in China by the side of the road, people collecting the plants and people selling the plants, there's a lot of people relying locally on this, this uh, harvest uh, of medicinal plants from the wild. And it's not just a small business uh, on the side of the road in China, it's also a big uh, multi-million uh, dollar industry and it, the trade, it's, it's grown so 1.3, the estimated billion in 1998 uh, to the value is over 3.3 billion and definitely there's there's a lot more supplements we're taking a lot more different things and i suppose yeah a lot of the plants going into these maybe you know are they from sustainable sources is a big issue going forward so some of the wild plants that they looked at in this report was um so they discovered that 125 different plant species were being used in uh for covid 19 treatment while we're all waiting on the vaccine and uh you know our place in the queue a lot of countries around the world such as africa many parts of Asia, South America, like there's there's still a lot of dependence on uh, traditional remedies and traditional medicines. So there's 125 different plant species in these um, formulas recommended for COVID-19. So in this report, they highlight that uh, licorice root, which is Glyceria, uh, and other CITES listed species, such as ginseng, aquilaria, and sabotum, uh, and they're all being sourced in the wild in China and internationally. So I just have some pictures here. So this is ginseng. We're all very familiar with ginseng. And this is like ginseng root here. So it's two different types. These are all regulated under CITES. Aquilaria, which is like a, a tree that becomes an, infected with a fungus. Very amazing thing. Agar wood, again, very, very uh, quite rare. And this lovely uh, fern here is sabotium. Uh, and uh, lovely sabotium is here. And this is also known as vegetable lamb because it has such furry stipes, these little uh, stems at the bottom that they they call, they call them lambs, vegetable lamb. Uh, so as I said, Chinese trade is allowed, but, reg but closely regulated. So you need the import and export permits. But ones that are not listed on CITES, such as this uh, licorice species, Glyceria. So these are also being used in the, in the traditional remedies. And there is concerns for some of these uh, about the status of them. Uh, there's commercial 
pressure uh, while plant over exploitation and it's regularly in, in some of these formulations and thanks to some of Augustin Henry's work we now can translate those Chinese uh, terms and names into the actual Latin species and the commercial uh, trade in licorice is really in these two species like Horiza glabra and Neuralensis and when we look up um, the IUCN Red List, which is the World Conservation Monitoring Union Red List, here you can see licorice, and this is the Mediterranean one, Glabra. This is the only one that we have actually conservation information on. Uh, it tells us its least concern, which is pretty good, but actually the population trend is, just, is decreasing. So while we, we might not be in the market for taking traditional Chinese medicine of licorice, but um, imagine a world without Bertie Bassett's, it would be pretty, pretty bad. So I suppose when we think back to Henry's time, we wonder, did Henry see a pristine environment in the late 1800s? Uh, and what did he think? And uh, this is um, a man he used to correspond with, who is reportedly colder than the surrounding Boston area, who's notoriously chilly. So obviously not a very friendly character, but uh, Augustine Henry liked to write, for him, write to him. So in 1897, this is uh, Professor Charles Sar Sargent at, uh, there's loads of plants called Sargentii as well at Harvard University. So Henry was lamenting that I've been to, I haven't been to any tremendous forest yet. I was in a forest that was 15 miles long, but had awful weather. And he just said, it's very curious to note how persistent the Chinese have been in deforesting their country. And also in another letter to Q around the same time, I really appeal to you to get some expedition to Western China. Uh, the work of the destruction of forests here is ongoing and rapid. And a lot of times when we went to, vill to villages in China on that 2002 expedition, um, we often got to see the only tree in the village. Oops, sorry, I have to go back here. Uh, so we're often brought to see the only tree in the village. So this is, uh, so many of those older trees are these wonderful old big, um, you know, swamps out the meta sequoias, the, the ginkgo biloba, these amazing trees that, um, that kind of have got through the ice age, tertiary, famous tertiary flora and uh, Emenoptis henryi. So every time we got to one of these big trees, we seem to have lots, lots of great slides here. I was all standing in front of the, lots of the last trees in the village around central China. So even when Henry was there, there really, he was lamenting the loss of forest and, uh, you know, when we went into that 2002, really the, a lot of the big trees that, that we did see, they were either on um, kind of high mountains or definitely in the lowlands and would have been all around the village. So Henry's thinking, he was already thinking in terms of kind of natural capital, natural environment. He quoted a guy called Alexander Humboldt um, in one of his lectures and he said, how foolish is man destroying the mountain forest because he depri deprives himself of wood and water at the same time. And I suppose we could add medicine and air to the statement now. So Henry was already thinking of kind of like a natural capital approach that uh, basically nature is there and it's a resource, it's an asset to us. And uh, Charles Nelson, a former taxonomist said, uh, basically he was a conservationist long before conservation became a fashionable pursuit. And it's sad to think that conservation is a fashionable pursuit. I, I think we're, go we're gone way beyond fashion now. It's not, uh, it's something that we all should really think about. So Henry was was quite advanced in his thinking, I think. And I think he's seen kind of firsthand in China, you know, some of the things that were going on. And it prompted him to change career when he came back um, to Ireland uh, from China. He, he stopped by France and he actually trained to be a forester in, in France. And he became a professor in UCD and he set up the first school of forestry in Ireland. And he researched um, some uh, uh, this book, Hen um, Augustine Henry and Elvis, Trees of Great Britain and Ireland. So he realized when he came back to Ireland that uh, we had very little forest in Ireland. What was happening in China in, uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s had happened in Ireland maybe a couple hundred years before that. And uh, when he was asked by one person, a professor, have you any uh, views on natural regeneration of forests in Ireland? He said, where have you the woods to regenerate? And uh, he already had, he realized when he came back that really we, we had, we didn't have the natural forests in Ireland. And it was one of his missions. And this is a, a great picture of some of Henry's uh, collections here. And here you can see uh, Matthew Jeb showing the collection off to uh, one of the heads of historic properties in OPW here. And each box has a, a species that can grow in Ireland in it and in Britain. So in all these boxes, uh, there's lots of notes, there's lots of 
information about seedlings. It's an amazing collection. And it's another thing I would urge anyone who hasn't seen the Augustine Henry Forest Collection to come in and see it. And uh, one of these boxes, Sitka spruce, is, is basically the tree we've picked from the Irish landscape. But just to find out, just to point out to you here, looking at all these boxes, there's a lot more trees that, that we can grow in Ireland. There's a lot more species that we can grow in Ireland. And that, um, yeah, and that Henry was thinking in this way uh, so long ago. So it's, re it's really quite amazing. So have we learned anything? Uh, and would Henry be pleased with us now? Well, when I looked up some of the reports on um, timber imports into Ireland, so I just go in 2017, uh, the Forestry Timber and Market Report from Ireland, Ireland imported 34, um, I can't even, it's Hollywood love this, uh, 34,000 metres cubed of sawn hardwood timber. So a value of just 30 million quid's worth and mostly direct, a lot of direct imports from the forests of Cameroon, Congo, Democratic Republic and the Ivory Coast. So if you just think of the map I showed you earlier, the World Resources Institute pointed out that we're losing, I think, something like 800 football pitches every hour of tropical forest. And for the three most recent years, you kind of think, oh, I've been hearing about the rainforest for a long time. But the last uh, 2016 where data is available, the three years where we have data, the highest was the highest rate of primary forest loss since the turn of the century. And the Democratic Republic of Congo has been doubling its rate of primary loss between 2010 and 2018. So it's really quite shocking. It's not gone away. And uh, what are we using all this timber for? Well, one species, uh, so I'm going to show you, there's all the countries that were important timber from, and there's the map I showed you earlier. Uh, so there's Democratic Republic of the Congo, 2090. There's Cameroon, probably, yeah, it's probably 2100. Um, yeah, Cote d'Ivoire is there as well, 2024. So we have been importing as a country, importing timber from these places. And in some cases, we've just been turning it into park benches. So. One of the things I see in trade sometimes is a roco. It's not a sightings listed species, but I do see a roco around the place. And uh, it's a hardwood tree from west coast of tropical Africa. And uh, this is a uh, Melissea, which is like uh, one the, this particular species. But also teak has been laundered through Africa. Um, Rosewood is a big issue. So really, we don't need African forests for our park benches. We really uh, need to, we really need to move on and kind of stop this. And we really need to be thinking of uh, becoming a little bit more sustainable and thinking a lot around forests and timber going forward. Henry, I don't think Henry would be pleased at all. But anyway, moving closer to home and back to the old 5K, uh, my favorite headline of the year is this kind of mirac miraculous find. Uh, so this was a re rediscovery of greenwind orchids in a meadow in uh, Port Leash. So here it is. We love a good miracle in Ireland. So this is our rare find, miraculous find in um, in 2020. And this was great because uh, it got everybody involved in it. it. Like obviously made the front cover of the Leash Nationalist as well. So. It was found in a housing estate, this really rare orchid, uh, and nearly 120 year, years after it was previously found in the area by another great Irish naturalist, Robert Lloyd Prager. So the likely explanation uh, for this popping up was that there was a delay in grass maintenance in the estate and allowed the plant to be flowered for the first time. But also very interestingly, it allowed the plant to be spotted for the first time. So a lot of us are walking around the same spots every day and we are actually noticing more things that are around our area, more plants that are around our area. And uh, and as Maria, I think she's online today there, she pointed out that not only do we get the plant, but we get the whole underground association of fungi. And we knew very little about these types of fungi in Ireland, that we get these this kind of whole kind of living ecosystem below the orchid as well as seeing the beauty on top. So I just think this is a lovely miracle and this is, some of the positive things to come out of 2020 is that we are walking around our 5k we're, we're, we're observing a lot more and we're leaving nature a lot more uh, alone so 2020 was also our first full biodiversity audit of a state property recording the plants and animals on a state property and our president has always been a great champion of uh, biodiversity and he said if we were coal miners we'd be up to our knees and dead canaries and I thought it was a very it's a very powerful statement and it's it's very true for today's world and he was fully supported of uh, this uh, trinity college um basically recorded lots of this is um one of the researchers here photographing and recording and there was lots of exciting finds i think it was 
badgers, uh, cave spiders, um, you know, all the different plants that they found in the order. And I think you can download this whole report to find out what plants and animals they found in the Oris uh, from the OPW, which is really good. So more biodiversity is appearing as we watch the grass grow because we have very little else to do. We're out watching what's around of us. And the National Biodiversity Data Center had 100,000 records from January to June last year, which was astounding. And I was saying that people are engaging a lot more biodiversity during the COVID-19 lockdown. And uh, yeah, we're all out there watching the grass grow. And I was definitely out with my daughter, Holly down there. We were doing our 5K and we we're lucky enough to, to have the, the beach just about within our 5K. And uh, yeah, this was it's scurvy grass or cochlearia growing on an armeria or sea trift. But also you can see at the background there as well, this is a lovely Xantria lichen. So the whole depth and what you can actually see in uh, in, a, in a square foot is, is just, there's so many species there and you just have to slow down and open your eyes and look. And Dublin, in fairness, everybody was out. You can see all the records were increasing in Dublin. So uh, and for every county, you can get a report of the county. And I was very heartened to see that in Dublin plants, there was over 3000 records of plants for Dublin, 34% of the records. So people, we are observing and we are interacting with plants a lot more uh, in, in every day and as we trump our 5K. So if you wanted to do this um, and you haven't done it before, it, it's a good idea. And where would you go to get help here with plant identification? Well, I'm putting up this picture of this lovely lady, Zoe Devlin, who's also on a second career, much like Henry doing amazing things uh, again in her second career. And she's wrote this lovely field guide, The Wildflowers of Ireland. And you can look up Zoe's website and she'll tell you what's in flower at the moment, which is very handy. And then if you still not kind of clear feel free to drop us an email and just send us a picture, maybe a clear picture of the flower, the leaf or whatever you want to see and just put on it plant identification requests and just send it to botanicgardens at opw.ie and uh, we'll send you the answer. So don't feel that you, you know, start partaking, start doing something here because uh, yeah, let's get out there and make it accessible for everyone. So another COVID trend was perfect for this weather because it's been pretty chilly to go outside is uh, we're all turning into houseplant parents and uh, it's filling voids in our social life and it's definitely yeah, doing a, a lot of good here, I can tell you, and uh, an influx of flora. So I suppose I would say once you start, you can't stop. If you start with one, well, then you definitely go for more and more and more. It is a bit of a of an addiction they give us a they give us a purpose i really like this uh, this article by this lady here and she said plants give us a purpose however small and they need to be nurtured and cared for or they will die believe me well yeah we we suffer a lot of deaths with house plants but it's it's a it's a wonderful trend and it's a big trend at the moment so this is uh, where i'm sitting today i've moved my new office mates here around me so you can kind of see them my fig and my peace lily and these are really easy things to grow and there's lots more you can get spider plants uh dumb canes snake plants and these are all widely available and it really changes the atmosphere and really changes it just brings this positive energy into our home. So I really like if I can't get out to the botanic gardens or into the botanic gardens, it's nice to create a bit of a jungle for yourself. And it's definitely very nice. And another uh, simple pleasure that I've really been getting into is propagating things just in water. And this is uh, my little uh, Tratus candy or Zebrina and uh, any bit that pop off, you just pop it into water. And it's just an old school way of plant propagation. And I have to say, yeah, it's definitely brought me great joy. And it's, uh, it's um, a really easy way to propagate plants. You don't, uh, you don't need soils, you don't need compost, you just need water. And my nan used to do this. And uh, it was very nice to remember that. So anyway, I'm going to cheer Augustin Henry up because um, he's generally not the smiliest of fellas, but I would say to you, I'd say today, get involved in saving forests in some way. They really are the lungs and the life support for our planet. And I would suggest to you, there's an EU forest strategy going on at the moment. And uh, the consultation is open till the 19th of April. And there's lots of questions in there going, uh, would you buy forests, you know, where would you buy your forest products? What kind of forest products do you want to buy? What kind of timbers would you like to buy? And uh, it's just trying to get a cross section of timber use in Europe and uh, basically the rules, what kind of things would be, you know, should we import our timbers or should we try and grow them? So I do think um, if you have time today, just look up the EU forest strategy and, and contribute to that um, consultation. And I think that would be a very positive thing to do. If you don't have time for that, just don't buy tropical timbers. Stay away from teak, aroca, rosewoods, 
all that kind of stuff. Uh, sponsor a furry animal, you know, I think uh, WWF have loads of them to sponsor in the wild because the money really goes to their habitats, which is great because we won't have those furry animals if we don't have the, the places that they live. So I think, uh, yeah, don't tell the, the animal people that, but the money really goes to the plants and uh, join Natural Capital and just read some of the blogs. They're totally free. And uh, so that's the number one thing to do. Just get involved. Number two, get on trend and grow some plants. And I would say anything will do. Start indoors in the windowsill. And I would say to you, this crazy plant guy here, he's got 350,000 followers on YouTube. And uh, this is a few entertaining episodes. Yeah, he's a crazy plant guy. So you could follow him, but also, or else you could just follow us on Facebook. And uh, I know uh, uh, Glenn and Charlotte and all the guys, um, like Kira, Melissa, they've all been doing, Mark, loads of stuff, putting loads of stuff online, loads of videos, loads of tours, loads of kiddie things to do. Um, and that's all online there. And uh, yeah, we just have 30,000 followers there, which, yeah, we just know, we don't compete with Crazy Plant Guy. Um, but anyway, and we've also a geeky one from the Herbarium. So the National Herbarium of Ireland, we have a Facebook and we also have a Twitter, so look us up. The other thing you do is you can join a plant society. There's loads more people out there to, to interact with. There's plant societies, alpine societies, royal horticultural societies. There's loads of societies for people to actually get involved with, which is really good. And the third thing you could do would become a biodiversity boffin. So as I said, you could download the, the app to your phone, which is very handy. So if you're out for a walk, you can just quickly take a picture. It automatically uh, takes in the location and uh yeah so if anyone asks you to, in years to come what you've done during the COVID crisis you can basically point smugly to your online records and remember at the botanic gardens we're here to support you with any plant identifications you might have and another group that's really good to join would be the botanical society for britain and ireland and they have a lot of plant identification courses and they have a lot of information online so yeah there's lots of things we can actually do so thanks for listening today. Stay safe and stay warm and stay very well. And I suppose, hopefully I pointed out to you today with those few maps that animals, plants and uh, our health were all truly independent. And this is the one health kind of approach that we really need to be thinking about for the future. So thanks for listening. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Oops. There we are. Now, Liam, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I really enjoyed that. And I think just looking at the comments that everybody else did as well. Great. We might take a couple of questions just before we go into the questions. Uh, just to yeah. remind everybody, if you want to put, put a question, just put it in, ask a question down the bottom. Um, I did a comment. There's loads of comments flying through. I can't follow them. Oh, yeah. Um, I did notice a comment, um, a sort of a mini debate when you were talking about importing tropical timber. Somebody suggested that we, you know, we should stick with native timbers, but somebody else said that, you know, we should, we actually need to import, uh, we need to import non-native timbers, but with very specific species and very controlled way. I don't know if you have a comment on that. Yeah, so I suppose my worry is, uh, you know, every time I go to those uh, meetings, the endangered species meetings, we really focus down on one particular species and be um, kind of down to the last few. And while we're focused on that species, a lot of the forest could be disappearing. So while we're making, reading a lot of reports of particular species, we may not be looking at the forest in general. So the minute you protect one species, the trade tends to shift towards a species that's not protected because the bureaucracy is is tough for protected species. You have to get paperwork and all this sort of stuff. So we really need to kind of protect at the bigger scale. And I would think, uh, yeah, like primary uh, tropical, subtropical forests, any of the species there, we really should just check the species name and just make sure it's not coming from those areas because there's certain areas where there is sustainability going on and in CITES we try and ensure sustainability but if or in the general situation is that Western African timbers are, are you know the, the situation is quite quite critical there at the moment yeah cool very good um folks there's a load of um a load of text going up um almost too many to follow so just once again if you have a question put it in the ask question down the end um, there is one in there, it's not specifically about uh, what you're talking about, Nolene, but maybe there's okay. some relevance. There's a, a chap asking, 
about the palm house in in the gardens that's been closed for so long have there been any particular differences without having any people in there closed the the, uh, the pandemic I'm not the sure pandemic. you're I'm not sure if I'm the person to answer. I yeah, wish I was in there. I wish I could move my desk in there. <laughs> yeah. Maybe yeah. I'm sure. Um, yeah. There's. Um, yeah. I suppose Brendan. Uh, the Brendans will be well able to answer that. Brendan Kelly or Brendan Sayers, which um, yeah. there's been lots of flowering that we're all missing out on them there. I know I've seen Strelitzia window and I'm waiting anxiously waiting my pickcorn plant to flower as well which normally flowers this time of the year so um, yeah yeah so there's yeah we're definitely missing seeing seeing what's happening in there yeah exactly and we will if we haven't answered everybody's question we will take them offline and make sure we'll get back to people afterwards um, anybody yeah, else got yeah, questions exactly. at all? well lots of um, lots of and loads of people we had over 200 people attending which is great and i think it's had a, a lot of a lot of interest with people and i think it, it really um it's really been uh, very useful for people so oh there might be another question coming through where are we let me see uh, where is it going? It's lovely to see all the comments it's a real um yeah because it's such a strange thing to be talking to yourself without people interacting. So it's it's lovely, been lovely to see all the texts and uh, yeah, I see uh, yeah, some nice friends on there and people I haven't been chatting to in a while. So it's, it's lovely to see everyone there, yeah. So the question is, um, Kieran says, I'm a relatively new gardener. The garden I tend is set to look after wildlife, and birds and insects, lots of wool and water. Is there a plant or plant you could suggest for a forest floor type enclosure that's a quite a specific one again um, yeah so i suppose um, i would say yeah uh, if you have a kind of a naturally kind of garden area that is sometimes the best thing you can do is kind of do nothing because plants tend to adapt i know um you know a lot of mosses would grow on the forest floor so if they're already there maybe just just leave them there so um if there's things maybe you could introduce if you wanted to be a little bit prettier maybe you could introduce some nice spring bulbs into it there's some nice ones around at the moment around this um it depends on on how on how much you want to do or how much you want to leave it natural you can you know if the the nature always finds a space you know um yeah so i mean definitely i would say just have a look around and see what you want how far you know do you want lots of color in area and definitely on a woodland floor like bulbs would be an obvious one to introduce lots of color yeah super duper um so yes just ask what, what's best to look out for in the bots in the coming weeks uh, uh, yeah, spring spring is fabulous in the spring. box. Uh, oh, it's so beautiful. Yeah, uh, they're definitely the rantus, the little yellow, the little yellow guys just in on the left on the gate. The chimananthus, another Chinese plant, and a lovely scent, lovely fragrance around the place. Um, spring is fantastic, and uh, yeah, there'll be lots of Chinese and lots of Henry links there coming into flower too, sort of peaking around May. Yeah, for those early early ones will all be in. Yeah. Yeah. And all the spring plants, all the spring bulbs. Um, yeah. I, I love every year they come up in they come up in a specific order every year and it's wonderful to see it. And you'll see the the daffodils are just about to oh, yeah, beautiful. Right on that. It's a lovely time, yeah. The gardens are fam fabulous in spring. It's really beautiful yeah. spring. Garden. It really is a fantastic time, yeah. yeah. Any other questions, folks? Oh, let me see. Uh, any particular diseases or viruses reported by Henry or yourselves on your travels to China? Particular viruses from in in us, in. Well, I'm not sure. Yeah, um, that's Mary O'Neill Maloney. Mary, do you have more specific question? Just you, you're wondering a, a sort of COVID-like viruses maybe is that it oh yeah well, well i had a great story we had a volunteer a few years ago lois um from trinity and she'd done a course um a tropical biology association course and they all stood in for a picture as everyone does with a big tree we done loads of it and uh loads of people got sick after standing under the big tree and no one could figure it out but they were actually um it, it was linked to bats as well so they had some sort of respiratory weird respiratory virus so a lot of um 
kind of like big old trees you know there's a lot of bat roots uh you know in the yeah in them in those these horseshoe bats and stuff yeah so they, they carry you know there is a big reservoir of yeah of, of viruses in them and i know lois case you know was, was was you know was fascinating lots of people got very ill so yeah i mean there's is out there and um, when we get close to creatures we don't normally get close to and and yeah things can happen yeah yeah, I was fascinated by the overlap of the, of your two maps, the um, the bio the the, the biodiverse um, nature of of wild animals in southern China, East Asia, and the, the the hunting overlapping with that, which yeah. I'm guessing is contributing to the viruses coming into our into the human way. That's it. Yeah, we're really cheap by jaw now. You know, yeah, yeah. The world is is has definitely shrunk, and uh, yeah, and trade has definitely grown. So, yeah, we got a lot more, and we're really, you know, we're just another species of mammal. You know, things are going to take advantage of us, like uh, like COVID. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah let me see. Anybody else? How are we doing for time? We have a few minutes more. If anybody else has any questions just while we're waiting just to remind everybody again that we have uh, in the botanic gardens we, we've a, a an array I suppose of lectures coming up we're trying to do now one sort of online event every wednesday broadly at three o'clock next wednesday um is the um online cafe in conjunction with um concern looking at uh, the united nations sustainable development goals so we're all to come to that and we will be putting up a list of all our events and this say that this you know at this time normally in the visitor center we would have a, a whole range of events in the gallery and in our uh, auditorium but unfortunately COVID has put an end to all of that so we're just trying to bring a bit of that out a bit of uh, entertainment and um out and um, digitally for for you all so i hopefully you, you'll uh, I can see some of our other lectures um, on, on Wednesdays. Um, any other questions? Actually, I see there's 12 questions now. Have I got through all of those? Okay, let me just read this one, Nolene. What are your thoughts yeah. on not just using plants for practical reasons, but enjoying, them, ooh, but enjoying them for what they are and bringing to nature and how that sort of cultural change could come about? Uh, so just enjoying them for what they are. Um, I think, um, yeah, um, you could look at a, a davidia and you would never think about wanting to chop it down. Um, but I, ha I have been in forests where they've identified this tree would make 12 boards or this one would make five boards. So I suppose, yeah, seeing the beauty in everything, davidia is, is just so wonderful beauty and even the tiniest of things you know our little lichens and our little mosses and uh yeah i think and i think we're doing more that you know this time around you know the the world has definitely changed in a year i mean yeah we're, we're definitely stuck to the 5k and just looking at all the records in dublin you know i mean who who would have believed it you know over three thousand plant records you know from january to june last year so yeah we are appreciating and i think it's yeah it's a good time for us to take stock and yeah, and I think we are taking stock as well. And I'd like to see, yeah, that maybe we just get a little bit more action about, you know, uh, I think somebody had um, comments there on palm oil, but like everything we do is is causing an impact. So, you know, you say if a butterfly flaps its wings in the forest, but like, yeah, if a bat flaps its wings in, in China, you know, can it affect us? And the thing is, yeah, it can, you know. So, yeah, we're all connected at that level, yeah. There was one more I saw about sustainable. Is, is there a sustainable supply of licorice? Licorice, uh, that's a good. Licorice. Yeah, I would say um, uh, I'm very boring. I would always ask, you know, if you are buying something, uh, wherever you're buying your licorice from, you know, just just maybe read the packet, see where it comes from. Uh, like definitely the species would be interesting. Uh, uh, this is a very geeky story, but uh, Radox, I think, ran a competition for like naming the secret herbs and spices in their bath salts years ago. And uh, I think it was the first time I picked up a box and I was like trying to uh, translate and win the money. <laughs> what species were in the Radox? So I would say to you, we have a look at the species of uh, Glyceria in the packet, and then you can go on the World Conservation Monitoring Union website 
and uh, you can actually download a conservation uh, assessment for that particular species if it exists. So that's a very geeky way of, um, yeah, just reading what's on the packet and doing, uh, looking up the Conservation Mon Union monitoring website, the red list, which is all the threatened plant species. So, yeah, if you want to be an ultimate geekatron, that's the way to do it. Yeah. But always look for fair wild or sustainable, any of those uh, stickers, you know, uh, fair wild is a very good one. So fair wild products, yeah. A question about Sitka spruce there. Do you see it as a barrier to us becoming self-sufficient in timber? Yeah, Sitka. And, and Sitka, I mean, uh, Henry, uh, he visited California, which um, I think um, somebody was, I think it was his wife was sick and he ended up in California. And it's really those... Um, those conifers from that part of the US grow really, really well in Ireland. And uh, Sitka spruce or the, you know, that whole Western um, fringe is uh, like all the species from around there grow really, really well in Ireland. And I suppose we've just picked one species. It's probably the, the sad fact of it. And when I showed the picture of uh, of Matthew and the herbarium there with all the boxes, like that's the number of different kind of trees we can grow in Ireland. So I suppose I would say, yeah, for, and there are efforts. I know Colin Keller who works with me as well. He's doing a lot of work on forestry genetics. So there's a lot of work happening uh, around forestry and creating sustainable forests for the future in Ireland. There's been a lot of work around that. Yeah. There's a couple more, Noli. We might wrap up shortly. Um, yeah. I'm going to, um, just throwing in, if I may, it's maybe slightly controversial question. But yeah. You some plants um, in developing countries, a lot of these developing countries don't have access to, to the virus in the same extent as, as we do in the West. And you mentioned the plants that are being used. Is there any evidence that these plants are effective in treating COVID or, it, or not? Or not, yeah. We're in very early days, I suppose, really, of, um, and I suppose, uh, I mean, licorice has been kind of known for respiratory things for a lot you know for a long time now so i suppose uh, with a lot of those treatments people have been if there's plants or medicines that have been kind of good for other things and they're good they're good medicinal plants like ginseng they're kind of good for everything but there's i suppose uh, getting the full evidence i mean we've been nowhere near um Having full trials on whether licorice is, you know, uh, act, you know, good, you know, would be a long way away from that, really. In yeah, um, yeah. so people like you know, pharmacognosy in departments, I'd say, would be you know, definitely well on all this kind of stuff, and they definitely look at traditional remedies and a lot of our. You know, like, uh, you know, the things, that, you know, our big, a lot of our big drugs would come from like taxes, uh, you know, taxol or the cancer drug would come, you know, originally from a traditional knowledge about a traditional kind of remedy or traditional plant or traditional thing. So they're a huge resource to us. We don't know what plant will actually medicine you know so it's great that we need that's why kind of one of the reasons we need to conserve all our biodiversity because we don't know whether it's licorice or thing or agar wood we don't know which one could be the one that could save us all and yeah i think it's we're a year into this now and you know we're all good hopefully getting the vaccine at some stage this year but i mean definitely remedies traditional remedies are a great source and and fountain of great source for us for, for medicines for the future yeah okay we're flying along i think maybe uh we might take one more which i see there if that's okay nolene yeah great Keep going. Sorry, that was a lot of, just um arthur there is asking does ireland have pro propagation and reintroduction protocols for endangered botanical species um i suppose it's all managed by national parks and wildlife service so any reintroduction would have would be carefully monitored um a lot of some of the reintroductions that we worked on at the gardens we would have had to get uh, special permissions we would have had to get a special license for for reintroduction of that species to the wild and thinking of a little uh the little cottonweed uh, project that we've been um doing with national parks and wildlife down in wexford and uh yeah I mean, we would be very careful about, you know, that it's all quite monitored and, and overseen. You can't just go out and do it if it's a very rare species. You you have to get the permits. You have to, you know, have some knowledge and do the research first. Yeah. Super. Folks, I think that's probably a good point to draw a line under. If we haven't got your question, we will go through the questions afterwards to make sure we've answered everything. So I think that's a good place. We're just coming up on the hour as well. So I really... Enjoyed that. I think everybody else did as well by looking at the comments coming through. So 
think we wrap up. Thank you so much, Nolene, for that. And thanks to everybody. We had over 200 at one point, 230 uh, online, which is fantastic. That's so. great, yeah. I've seen a few names. Yeah, God, hi, everybody. It's lovely to, to yeah, have you online here. Yeah. Okay, so folks, I'm going to um, I'm going to hit the end broadcast, and thank you all for joining. And uh, we might see you at the next couple of, um, of of lectures. If you have any more questions, you can always send it to us at the Botanic Gardens, and we look after it. Okay. Thanks, thanks Lynn. Thank everybody. you, everybody. Bye, bye, bye. Thanks, Lynn.